Good morning. Good to be together this morning. Glad to see you here. Be part of our worship together. If you're visiting with us once again, want to make sure you know that you are welcome. We love having you here and hope that you can come back anytime that you can. If you would go ahead and open your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2 is where we're going to take our message from this morning. <clears throat> You know, as a child, receiving gifts was such a thrill, wasn't it? Maybe we're still children. Some of us really still like to get gifts, too. There's something on our list that we've just been itching to have, and we finally have it. But certainly thinking about the child, always wondering what was under the wrapping paper or inside the stocking, and you could not wait to get to use that new gift. But, you know, as we grow older, uh, we begin to see the joy of giving a gift a little bit more. And perhaps that takes on a greater joy than actually even receiving a gift. We want to see the joy that the person receiving the gift is experiencing and getting to see what we've gotten for them, that what we have thought about that they could use or that they could enjoy. And the greater joy is seeing them actually utilize that gift for more than maybe the five minutes that they're playing with it or tinkering with it when they opened it up. But you know, God has really done the same thing with us. He has given us his word. And we sing a song, number 327, called What Shall It Be? I believe Brother Randy's one who, who uh, leads this song from time to time, uh, among others. But it asks a question. It says, what will you do with Jesus? The question comes to you, and you must give an answer for something you must do. What will you do with Jesus? Well, how would we even learn to know what to do with Jesus if it wasn't recorded for us in God's word? And so to think about the gospel, the good news of Jesus, the good news of salvation is really a gift that God is kind of waiting around to see what are we going to do with? How are we going to enjoy the gospel? It's not just from the standpoint of entertainment. There's certainly entertainment to be had from reading of these historical and incredible records of our Savior, but more importantly, there's enjoyment from the standpoint of you can be part of this story. Really, whether or not we engage with the gospel, we will become part of the story sooner or later, but that this is something that God has given to us, and it is something that we must do with. There's something that we need to determine on how we're going to utilize this. And so thinking about God being a gift giver, the question is whether or not we will use his word and, in fact, really, whether or not we're going to be pleasing to him with this gift. As we said before, we've experienced seeing the pleasure of someone else utilizing the gift that we've given, and we get pleasure from that. God gets pleasure from seeing us live out the gospel. He has pleasure in seeing us engage and live out this gospel message in fact it's the language that's used here in first thessalonians chapter 2 but before we get into that let's review what we have talked about last month regarding chapter 1 paul is most emphatically thankful for the church in thessalonica we see this isn't the only time that he expresses a thankfulness for the church either in a local area or overall but amidst difficulty, we see in verse 6, these brethren in Thessalonica still accepted the gospel message. He says, you became imitators of us and of the Lord, for you received the word in much affliction. They proved to continue to grow in faith, love, and hope. And when you pile that on top of the fact that they were dealing with difficulty, they were growing in their faith towards God. And then the reputation of faithfulness, it wasn't just in that area, but it expanded outside of the realm of Thessalonica. As we see there in verse 8, not only has the word of the Lord sounded forth from you in Macedonia and Achaia, but your faith in God has gone forth everywhere so that we need not say anything. And then the power of the gospel among them was evident when considering where they once were. These were not necessarily ready-made, cookie-cutter, the perfect prospect you would expect to obey the gospel they were just missing the purpose of why they are 
well behaved and have good morals. These people were involved in idol worship. They were pagans. And so thinking about that, verse 9 they themselves report concerning us the kind of reception we had among you and how you turned to God from idols to serve the living and true God and then to wait for his son. And that actually leads us to the repeated theme. As you'll probably notice as we progress through this letter, it seems as though the concern or the confusion with the brethren in Thessalonica, the, maybe the impetus for this letter, is their concern about how is this all going to shake out when Jesus comes back? If I'm not still alive when Jesus comes back, am I really going to get to be with him? And Paul would clear that up. He would explain that and really tell us what it's like for us after we die or if Jesus comes back while we're still alive. And so we see that theme repeated in chapter 1 and in chapter 2 and in chapter 3, chapter 4 and chapter 5. But the really the concentrated section is chapter 4 verses 13 through 5. And, 11. and we'll get to that passage eventually, probably within the next few months. But as you may have noticed from the title slide, this is going to, if things go according to plan today, uh, be a two-part lesson. And the first part is pleasing God in sharing the gospel. You might say, okay, well, this is just a sermon for Jared and maybe some of the teachers in, in our audience today. But I hope that this is a lesson for all of us. Certainly, this is one that is a motivating lesson for me to refresh me and, and remind me of what my task is, specifically as a gospel preacher. And as Brother Jimmy read for us in 2 Timothy 4, verses 1 through 5, that's kind of a call to arms for me in the work that I am supposed to do. But I hope we see here, as Paul's talking about in, in 1 Thessalonians 2, that this is really a recipe for us to understand the importance of sharing the gospel and what it can do, and what we are to focus on in sharing the gospel. Because any one of us can share the gospel. We don't have to be formal preachers or teachers, but we can share it across the lunch table. We can share it in a living room or a kitchen table or wherever we may be. We can share the gospel, and we need to focus on certain things in regards to that and know that we can be pleasing to God in how we share the gospel. And first of all, I want us to understand that we need to focus on truth. We need to understand the purpose of sharing the message. As we see there in verse 1 of chapter 2, For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. So there's a purity in that. And we need to understand that if truth is not the most important thing, both in our message and in our motivation, the gospel will not be presented in its most pure form. Okay, we need to understand how important it is to make the goal to be truth. We'll get to the idea of opinions and preferences here in a little bit, but above all else, truth is, bar none, the most important thing that we need to be focused on. We need to understand that working for the kingdom includes dealing with challenges and with frauds. We look at verse 2, but though we had already suffered, so Paul's already talked about their affliction, but though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare you, to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. Do you know what he's referencing there and the trouble they had at Philippi? It takes us back to Acts chapter 17 and really Acts chapter 16. If you want to look there for a moment, in Acts chapter 16, there's a situation afoot with Paul and Silas and they will eventually get thrown into prison. But because of this slave girl who had a spirit of divination, as we read in verse 16, and her owners were gaining much by her fortune telling. And so what we see is that they are vain. They're the ones that are doing this out of, out of greed. And, and that will be a theme in this chapter of, of 1 Thessalonians 2 as well. But in verse 19, we read, when her owners saw that their hope of gain was gone because Paul called her out and, and commanded the spirit to come out of her in the name of Jesus, the owners saw that their hope of gain, of income, was gone. They seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace before the rulers. And when they had brought them to the magistrates, they said, these men are Jews and they are disturbing our city. They advocate customs that are not lawful for us as Romans to accept or practice. 
The crowd joined in attacking them, and the magistrates tore the garments off them and gave orders to beat them with rods. And when they had inflicted many blows upon them, they threw them into prison, uh, ordering the jailer to keep them safely. Having received this order, he put them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks. And that's where we come to the story of the Philippian jailer who is then converted. Remember, the, the prison bars flew open and he thought he was a dead man. And so he was about to kill himself. And Paul stopped him in his tracks and they, they taught him the gospel. Then you go to chapter 17 and verse 1. That is when they come to Thessalonica. Now when they had passed through Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica where there was a synagogue of the Jews. So perhaps this is the first interaction, uh, it would seem, uh, if I understand correctly, for Paul to, to be there in Thessalonica. This is where their history is. And Paul is now making reference of that here in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. And so we think about how challenging the gospel can be for people. And part of the challenge is there are frauds among us. I'm not suggesting that among us here, but in the world, there are plenty of frauds who pose as preachers of the gospel, who say one thing and do the complete opposite, who are using the uh, kind donations of others or the collection of the church to fund a Learjet or to do whatever, to do, to do whatever, to, to fancy themselves and to profit off of the gospel in a very materialistic way. And we certainly can see that that is sinful. We see that there are, are those who water down the gospel and what we'll, we'll touch on here in a little bit and understand that the true gospel appeal has to be rooted in truth and should come from a trusted source. We look at verse 3 of 1 Thessalonians 2. Paul uses that word there, at least in the ESV. For our appeal does not spring from error, or impurity, or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak. And so, understanding the word appeal, the word appeal there in, in this context is like making an appeal before a judge or, or to someone to please just really listen to what I have to say. But really, on the other side of that word, and another way that we use the word appeal is what is the appeal of the gospel? Going back to our first point, uh, or our header there, is really the truth. Anybody who's truly interested in the gospel, hopefully their desire is to have the truth. That someone truly searching to understand God, to please God, to serve God, to be saved from their sins, they want to know the true way to go about it. Not an opinion, not a supposition, not a tradition, but to understand what is the truth. We look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. For some reason, there we go. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And certainly there is onus on our part as presenters of the truth, as one who desires to share the gospel to make sure, again, that our focus is on the truth. And the only way we prove ourselves to be about the truth is to understand it, to be well-versed in it, to understand that this is what God's Word says, this is the context of this passage, this is what He's really saying here, and that we're not about sharing our opinion, our preference, or our ideas, because Bottom line is, that's not the gospel. God does not care in the grand scheme of things when it comes to sharing the gospel what your opinion is or what your preference is. But yet that's what we have among the churches in the world today is a whole lot of opinion and a whole lot of preference. The appeal has to be the truth. Again, Verse 3, our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive. And there are some who accept these deceptions wholeheartedly, but I would, I would suppose from 
a sincere heart, maybe because of tradition, maybe because they've not thought about, there are other factors and play here of why they do the things that they do, or maybe because mama or daddy or grandpa or grandma or whoever has worshipped this way for a long time. That's something I have to be careful of even in worshipping the way I do. I've been raised in this. But I can't be doing this because, well, that's what mama and daddy did. I need to be doing this because I see this is the truth. That this is what God truly says. This is what matters. And it's not because of preference, tradition, ideas, or opinion. That is not the gospel. And if that's all we're doing, we're not obeying the gospel. We're obeying just puppeteering of, of just, I'm going to follow the motions of what I've seen done for me before. Understanding the appeal has to be the truth. And so if our focus is on the truth and we understand that first and foremost, we need to then focus on what our message is going to be. And well, you could say, well, the message is going to be the truth, right? Yes, but how are we going to go about that message? Look there again at the second half of verse 4. So we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor do we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. We need to remember that this is the gospel of God as we looked at verse 2. This is the message. We've been given the message to share. It doesn't need any alteration. It doesn't need any tailoring to fit any certain situation or any certain uh, parameters. God set the parameters. He set the score. He knows what he wants to be shared. He has provided us the gospel of God. We can't overstate and we can't afford to undersell this. That when we open God's word and what we're doing right now, we are allowing God's word, we're allowing God to speak to us. To understand as Jesus told us to proclaim it, as he told his first apostles and disciples to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. Where's the expiration date in that? There is none, is there? There's going to continue to be creation. As long as there continues to be children that are being born into this world, there is a need for the gospel to be shared. There is no end in sight to this until Jesus returns. And so Jesus says that we must proclaim it. And there's nothing to be ashamed about because it's for all. You want to talk about the divisiveness of the world that we live in today. This is the one thing that can unify everyone. Look at this passage in Romans chapter 1. Paul says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, as it is written, the righteous shall live by faith. This is a passage that should shoot down Calvinism. This is a passage that should shoot down racism among Christians. And I know there are some who wear the name of Christ or proclaim to be who are racist, and we need to make sure that we're not one of them. But what Paul is making clear here is the gospel literally, truly is for all. This is not something we pick and choose who gets to hear it. We don't pick and choose who we want to come in through those doors. No matter what their background is or was, they are welcome here to hear the gospel message of Jesus. Because guess what? They're a sinner just as much as you and I have been. And we need to understand that this is meant for them. There's nothing to be ashamed of this gospel because it is all-inclusive. Does it mean you get to live the way you want to after understanding the gospel and obeying it? Absolutely not. But yet again, that's what unifies us, right? That unity that Paul talks about there in Ephesians chapter 4, that we are one body, one faith, one church, one hope, one Lord, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all. And so we need to understand that this is something that we should be, I use the word carefully, proud to be able to share from the standpoint of God wants you and I to be armed with this gospel and to share this gospel with others to be humbled by the fact that we have this opportunity to share this message and understand how it shoots down Calvinism and other false doctrines. 
is that you have a choice to make, and I have a choice to make, to both receive and to share this gospel. It's not something that God is picking and choosing who is elected and who is not. It's for all who believe. And so we speak to please God and not man, as we see in the second half of verse 4. This is what we're talking about here in our lessons today. Our goal is to please God. Now, there are plenty of preachers and teachers in the world, and, I, and they, they are riddled all over social media and all over the religious channels that you get to, he, to see on, on cable or whatever. That's all they're about is pleasing man. Make no mistake about it. They're there collecting a paycheck to please man. And I've sadly had, had I don't know of specific situations, but others have informed me of saying it's coming in the church as well, among the church of Christ, that there are preachers that are just preaching for their paycheck and not touching on difficult subjects, not focusing on things that are really at the heart of, of issues within the church because they're scared of running people away. I have told you before of, of the situation that I know of personally in Arkansas of a congregation, congregation chasing off a preacher because they didn't like him saying that they need to reconsider whether or not they should allow their children to go to dances and things like that. He lost his job because he was preaching from the Bible. And so we need to make sure that we understand this is, the, as, as was read in 2 Timothy 4, a time coming with itching ears, which we'll look at here in just a moment. But understand that this boldness is found in God. Paul talks about this boldness there in verse 2, uh, the, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. So saying what he needs to say regardless of what is surrounding him, not being afraid to share the truth no matter what, understand how God has been at the center of all of this. He's approved the message to be shared. While he's dealing with, or Paul's dealing with himself as an apostle of Jesus as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, know that in the grand scheme, God approves his message to be shared by anyone. That anyone who has obeyed the gospel of Jesus can then share the gospel. He's approved for this message to be shared and to understand that it is intended to be shared and to understand that God is the one who tests our hearts as he tested Paul's heart. He tests our hearts. He tests any preacher and teacher's heart of the gospel. God is in the center of all of this. And so if God is in the center of this, understand flattery does not produce faith in God. If, if that's what we're here for, to just get this, this little tickling of the ears of just hearing something pleasant all the time, and I understand there's a time and place to have lighter-hearted sermons and, and messages like that, and we've mixed some of those in here lately, but to understand that there is a time and place for a message. And that Paul's not just writing this just to be writing it, but he has an intention in mind to address them. And he has a lot of positive things to tell them here. And he's reminding them of the history that he has with them. But to understand that there is no place in the pulpit for flattery. Flattery does not produce faith. Flattery, what that does is it produces a confidence in self, in trusting in self and taking the focus away from God. The question is, are we here to feel warm and fuzzy about ourselves or are we here to light a fire, to have passion and conviction and say, this is the word of God, this is the word that I live by, this is the word that I teach my children by, this is the word that I want to share with others. It's not about you and it's not about me. It's about God and his truth and his salvation that he's offering for you and I. We're not here to get the warm and fuzzies. Is, can that be a byproduct of knowing that we're receiving the truth, knowing that we're doing what God tells us to do, knowing that we're humbly submitting to his will? Sure, that, that can be a byproduct. But if all we're here is for some softball message to just not really have to think about anything, not really have to mull anything over, not really have to think, 
is this something that I'm struggling with right now? Is this something that I really need to make sure I'm applying to my, my life right now? Is this something that maybe I need to repent of either publicly or privately? That's what we're here for. That's what the gospel does. The gospel cuts to the heart. It should convict, it, could, it should show us that we are needing to evaluate all the time, just as James talks about looking in the mirror. And as we touched on in 2 Timothy 4 and verse 3, for the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, or as other passages indicate, having ears tickled, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. You might say, well, we're, we're not accumulating in that way, but you're going to go where you want to hear what you want to hear. At least some people will. I don't think that is the case for us here. I sure hope not. But there are people like that in this world who choose where they go because of the type of message they're going to hear. And if it's going to challenge them, if it's going to convict them, if it's going to make them feel any kind of guilt because maybe they haven't been living up to the gospel, well, I don't want any part of that. People are like that, and the time is now. That's going on all around us. That's why there are thousands of denominations in the world. That's why... There are those who, who just go for the softball messages and don't want to really have to think about anything. Let that not be us. And so as we also see in this section, verses 5 and 6, that greed and self-glorification doesn't draw people to God, but to the speaker or to self. Again, focusing on us as ones presenting the gospel and sharing the gospel. Again, it is not for... Uh, gain in an earthly way there there is foundational truth in, in seeing that that it is fine to compensate a preacher obviously that that's being done here but to to be all about just a a worldly desire that is coming from from preaching the gospel and just wanting to to get rich off of the gospel there is no place for that as he talks about here again in verse five we never came with words of flattery as you know nor with a pretext for greed God is witness. As we'll touch on later this evening, Paul will talk about their labor and toil, that they worked night and day, some indication that they didn't want to be a burden to the brethren there. Maybe they were financially strapped as uh, a people, and so perhaps Paul took on secular work to help make ends meet while he preached the gospel. And there are certainly situations like that, even in our, our country and around the world. But nor did we seek glory from people. Paul and Silas and Timothy and, and others were not in this to make sure that they were being glorified, but that God was being glorified. And so understanding he could have made demands as an apostle. He could have shown them that, hey, I've, I've paid my dues. I've spent the time with you. Know who I am and that I've been approved by God and over and over but again, we see the way that they have dealt with them and that his goal was not for greed and it was not for glory, but it was for the glory of God. We think about a situation in Acts chapter 8 where that was the case with Simon the magician or Simon the sorcerer, as you may have it in your Bible. But in Acts chapter 8 and verses 9 through 25, that was the problem with Simon. We read there that he was one who had previously practiced magic in the city and amazed the people of Samaria, saying that he himself was somebody great. They all paid attention to him from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the power of God that is called great. And they paid attention to him because for a long time he had amazed them with his magic. But when they believed Philip as he preached good news about the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Even Simon himself believed, and after being baptized, he continued with Philip and seeing signs and great miracles performed, he was amazed. And we see over further down in verse 15, he wanted, uh, actually in verse 17, they laid their hands on them and they received the Holy Spirit. When Simon saw that the Spirit was given through the laying on of the apostles' hands, he offered them money saying, give me this power also so that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. But Peter said to him, may your silver perish with you because you thought you could obtain the gift of God 
with money. You have neither part nor lot in this matter, for your heart is not right before God. Repent, therefore, of this wickedness of yours and pray to the Lord that, if possible, the intent of your heart may be forgiven you. And so we see the greed there that Simon had. He had the focus of the people. He wanted that focus back, and he, he shows himself to be greedy in this situation. And that is not what preaching the gospel and sharing the gospel is about. Obviously, those gifts are gone of giving the Holy Spirit by the laying on of hands. The only giving the Holy Spirit we have is giving the inspired message of God to others. But the motivation cannot be, well, I want to be able to say that I've taught so many people and I've baptized so many people and I'm responsible for that person's salvation and others. Paul would talk about that as well of saying, I'm glad that I'm not baptized any of you except for one or two because people were saying, I am of so-and-so and I am of so-and-so. That's the person that baptized me. It doesn't matter who baptized you. It matters that you were baptized into Christ. And as one teaching and preaching the gospel, it doesn't matter who you've taught the gospel to, but it matters that you've taught the gospel of Christ. This is not the gospel of Jared or of Billy or of Charles or Josh or anybody else. This is the gospel of Jesus, and it's that gospel that matters. It's that truth that matters. And so if our focus is on the truth and our focus is on the message, we need to focus on the hearers as well. We read in verse 7, but we were gentle among you like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. What good is the message if there's no consideration of the hearers? If we just go into a situation with guns blazing and say, I'm going to say what I need to say and I don't care who I offend and, and how I say I'm just going to say what needs to be said, how effective do you think your message is going to be? How effective do you think God's message is going to be if we don't think about the people we're speaking to? We were gentle, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. What kind of image is Paul trying to paint here? I mean, I don't think he can make it any clearer. That is one of the most intimate and most personal things in, in a human relationship that there can be of mother with child, nursing them, feeding them, giving them nourishment. And that's what Paul is saying they're doing. We're, we've been feeding you. We've been nourishing you. And the way that it has been done has been with gentleness. Say what needs to be said, no doubt. We need to say the things that need to be said, but we need to say them in a way that it needs to be said. As we read in Ephesians 4, 15, to speak, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head into Christ. And that's more dealing with how we speak the truth to one another as brothers and sisters in Christ. But that also can play into how we speak to others in sharing the gospel. Having a spirit of gentleness, I believe, as we see in, G in G uh, Galatians chapter 6. But understanding it is fine to say the hard things. We're expected to say the hard things. How many difficult things did Jesus have to say? But do you think that it came from a heart of love? Why else was he here? Why else did he come but because of love? Because of the love that he had for his creation. Because of the love that he had for his father and for his father's will. And for us to have any other motivation but love, we need to reevaluate why we do this and how we do this. Because sharing the gospel really is about sharing ourselves. Again in verse 8, so being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves to be affectionately desirous of you. We want the best for people, for every person, no matter how vile they are. Remember, these people were pagans, idol worshipers. They may have been doing some pretty heinous things in regards to their idol worship. But yet, Paul is not going to be focused on that, but he's focused on where they are now and how he has grown in a relationship with them and understanding 
that the gospel is a personal gospel. It is meant to be shared person to person. It is meant to be shared in this fashion, in preaching and in teaching, and it's meant to be shared with emotion and with, with conviction. And we need to be ready to share that. As preachers and teachers and as neighbors with others, we need to be ready to share. As he says again there in verse 8, that we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. Why was he ready to do that? Because Paul knew the gospel had changed him. That he was a living example of the gospel there and understanding that this is something that is personal. This is something that Paul is sharing now of himself. Again, it takes us back to Galatians 2.20, that I have been crucified with Christ, and it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And so this gospel is not just words on a page. It's not just words that Paul's inspired by, but it is the life that he is living that he is now sharing with them. This is a personal thing. You had become very dear. This relationship had been built, and now there is history with them. They had become very dear. They are still very dear, and because of what he is sharing and in how he is sharing it. What we need to understand is that pleasing God is the priority. That's why we do this. As we looked at there in, in this passage in verse 4, that we're not here to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. He is going to test our hearts. He is testing our hearts currently. And so our goal is to please God. That's why our focus is on the truth. That's why our focus is on not flattering, but sharing the truth. That's why our focus is not on greed or on, on gain, but to understand that we are here to please God. That is priority one. But again, the byproduct can be by being a blessing to others as well. That when you share the gospel and when you share of yourself, share the thing that has changed your life, that has changed your heart, how is that not going to be a blessing to others? So while pleasing God is the focus, you being a blessing to other people, bettering their lives, showing them there is a right way to go about this life, that it is not subjective to opinion and preference, preference, but there is an objective, substantial way that you can live your life, that you can change your life, that you can allow God to change your life, you're going to be a blessing to others. So what is there to be ashamed of? We have the most precious document, the most precious message on the face of this planet. How can we afford not to share it? How can we afford to keep our mouths closed about the Savior who saved us and who can save other people. And so let's be sure that we are pleasing God by sharing the gospel, pleasing God by living the gospel. And as we'll talk about this evening, we can be pleasing to God in how we hear the gospel as well. And so if you are subject to the invitation by hearing the gospel this morning, knowing that you need to make things right in your life, whether you're a Christian and you need to repent of something and need the help of the congregation in a public way, or you're not a Christian and you need to obey the gospel for the first time. And understand, this is a life-saving message that God has given you, a life eternal message that will change your life, not just here now, but for all eternity, and that you can spend eternity with God through your obedience of this message. Is there some way we can help you this morning? If so, come now while together we stand and while we sing.